Wireless controllers are normal. Everything comes with wireless controllers and has done for nearly 20 years. But that wasn't always the case. Before these guys here, consoles came with wired controllers by default. If you wanted wireless, you had to go out and buy one separately if they were available. My first wireless controller was one of these, a Nintendo GameCube Wavebird controller. It runs on two AA batteries and it has no vibration function so that the batteries last for ages. I played a ton of Super Smash Brothers on this thing. These controllers on this side all have something in common. They use RF, radio frequencies to communicate with the console. Before the Wavebird in 2002, all the wireless controllers I knew of used infrared. This is a NES controller from 1990. Acclaim made this one and I'm pretty sure Nintendo were happy to give them the credit for it. Infrared is a beam of infrared light that we can't see, but it's directional, works like a TV remote. Here's the receiver for these. You need to have it pointed at the receiver the whole time you're playing or your button presses just won't go through to the console. As a result, they didn't sell very well. Not many companies picked it up, except Bandai, which advertised that it had an infrared raised control and it was terrible, the Playdia is terrible. This one's from an interesting system called a DVS CDI, originally made by Philips. It has one of the worst controllers I've ever seen. This one's lucky enough to have all the caveats of being infrared as well as terrible. You've got a D-pad in the middle, and a button either side of it. So there's really not any way to play this comfortably. Your thumbs are always crashing. When I started looking into what the first wireless controllers were, I figured it would be more of this sort of stuff, covered in turbo buttons and slow-mo switches and that sort of stuff, aftermarket junk, really. So you can imagine my surprise when these turned up. Wireless Atari 2600 controllers, and they're RF too. They've got huge floppy antennas. And look at the size of the receiver. It's also got a huge antenna on it. These are called the Sinex Game Mate 2. I guess it's a a sequel to having actual mates, somehow. Skipping most of the 80s, right back to 1982. I don't even think there are any other RF controllers between these and the Wavebird in 2002. Well, I've got no idea where I'm up to because I just found this little lady on the floor. And since she looked like she needed rescuing, I'm gonna put her outside. That's right. Look at the size comparison. It's the same on top, but twice as tall. Now, I've never tried these. I don't know if they work. And in fact, the guy I got them from told me that they didn't work. So let's test them and see what happens. These take a nine volt battery each. Can you imagine churning through nine volt batteries? These things are not cheap. I don't think they've ever been cheap. Let's see what happens. Oh, look, it doesn't work. What about the other one? No, nah, nothing. Well, I guess he didn't lie. Time for some disassembly. I think there's a slightly better chance the base station's bad over both controllers being bad. Wow. I was hoping there'd be an adjustment in here. There's a lot of adjustments in here. The manufacturer's also sanded off all of the tops of the chips so that I can't tell what they are. It's to prevent reverse engineering, but it also makes it very hard to repair. I suppose I should just check the basics. Does it have power? Power should come in here, then it goes to this guy here. What are you? You are, ah. Oh. You are broken. I might have just found the problem straight away. This guy here has got its face burst out. What that is, is an eight volt regulator. The Atari power cable is nine volt. That comes in here, then it connects straight to this regulator, which supplies the whole rest of the board with eight volts. Eight volts is a bit strange. I definitely don't have any more eight volt regulators, but I can kind of patch it up and see if it works. Blown regulator. To test if that's the only thing that's wrong, I can connect my benchtop power supply to this. Yeah! All right, let's go. One of the pages I read online about these controllers is that they had input lag, but this doesn't have input lag. Does controller two work? <laughs> they both work. It's just that one chip that's broken. This guy here was all that was stopping the whole thing from working. Apparently these things have about a six meter range or 20 feet. So I'm gonna just hold down this button and walk as far away as I can get without going outside. Hopefully I can still hear the shooting noise. I'm at least eight meters away now and there's stuff in the way as well. It's still working. That's pretty impressive. So obviously having this connected to my benchtop power supply is not ideal. And a lot of you know by now, I like to get a job done with what I've got at the time. I don't have an eight volt regulator, but I'm gonna see what I can find to make something else work. So I've been hunting for a while. Where did that pencil come from? Must have been up there. For a little while, this had me seriously worried. Originally I was gonna use a buck converter, but it turns out these ones only boost up, not down. So coming from nine volt down to eight volt was never gonna work. So I had a huge hunt. None of my old scrap boards had anything. They're all 7805s and 7812s like I expected. Five volt and 12 volt. That's normal for digital stuff. This is not digital. And most analog stuff doesn't use regulators like this. Eventually though, I found an old electronics kit which had never been assembled and inside it, a 7808. Now, it's not quite the same, but I'll make it work. 
Now this one has slightly different connections, so it has to be put in backwards. And it also doesn't fit through the circuit board, so hopefully I can use this piece of IC socket to adapt it. Excellent, the spacing's the same. I don't really want that to just do that. It's not good. I'm gonna put a tiny bit of hot glue here. And I'm going to shorten the legs of this right down. And it doesn't spring about anymore. And it works. And hopefully, yes, it does, it works. This housing is such a generic mold that they've just made some special parts for. I wouldn't be surprised if you can still buy project cases like this. I fell down the hole. Oh, wall jump. I just had a thought. The way this is wired up, the power adapter plugs into this, and then this comes out and plugs into the Atari. That means when you turn the Atari off, this thing still has power. There's no wonder that regulator was blown. The first voltage spike they would have had through the house would have killed it. Now here's something I didn't expect. I thought I'd try and tune this in. I thought I would hear the signal, but <laughs> I can see it. It's very touchy. If I'm not right next to it, I don't see it, but each button closes up a gap. The directions are buttons too. I do up, it does weird things because it's the top line. How cool is that? I'm really surprised that this is coming through as a visible TV signal. It must be running as a harmonic of 15 kilohertz or something to make it actually work properly. It's, it's really strange, actually. I'm still interested to see what's inside these controllers. What have we got in here? All right, we've got a circuit board in here that might come out. Yeah, there we go. Just like the receiver, this IC has the top scrubbed off, so we can't see what that is. But it probably takes the digital signals from the buttons and converts them to something that can be sent out through the aerial. Let's see what the button board looks like. Yep, it's just got buttons. These kinds of buttons are kind of annoying to service. You gotta peel the plastic off. All they are is a curved piece of metal which sits over two contacts. When you push the metal in, it clicks in. The middle of the metal touches here. The outside's already touching here, so it completes the circuit. I don't wanna go any further because the plastic's coming apart, but I'm gonna give this one a bit of a clean. It's the fire button at least. I'm just using some isopropyl alcohol on a cotton bud. Here's the circuit board out of a regular Atari controller. You can see it's very similar. I actually expected this board to be identical to this one, but I guess Sinex made their own. There's one more thing I'd like to try, and that's seeing if the signal from this is visible on my oscilloscope. Well, it took me way too long to get this to work. And this is the signal straight off the aerial. These dips here are probably what we saw on the TV as white lines, and each button closes up one of these gaps. There's an extra gap here at the beginning, which doesn't seem to be affected by anything. I think that's probably just so the receiver knows there's a signal coming, but I'm only guessing, I'm not really sure. Without knowing what this chip is, it's proper reverse engineering to try and figure out what this space is actually for. I still think it's kind of cool seeing the gaps close up. Ah. So, Sinex Game Mate 2, any good? Yeah, they do what they say. They work, there's no lag. You don't have to point it at the console. It's got heaps good range. I got something like eight meters away with arcade machines in between and it still worked. Even Atari liked them. And Sinex started making them with the Atari branding on them in 1983. I'm guessing the reasons that these didn't take off more for other systems as well is just cost. It's pretty much the same thing for any failed system really. It's either incompetence or cost. But you can bet I'm gonna be using these from now on. These things are great. <laughs>